our belief is that the Quran is the ultimate literature. Compared to any language, the Quran is the ultimate literature. But that's a subjective thing. If you're literature students, I think this is a science school, but literature is not objective, it is what? It's subjective. So you say it's beautiful, I say it's ugly, right? You like that poem, I, li I don't like that poem. You like this song, I don't like that song. Don't listen to songs, but I'm saying, okay? Or you like this painting, I don't like that painting. It's subjective. So you could argue that literature is what? It's subjective. But I began by saying Allah says that the Quran is balagh. It is a means of communication. And the point, the purpose of communication is to influence the audience. So we will judge what is better literature by what? What's the, what's, the, what's the measuring stick? What influence does it have? What impact does it have on the world? What change does it cause? How does it change people? How does it influence behavior? How does it modify people's behavior? How does it command over people? That will be the judge. That's a practical judge of the power of any speech, any literature. You could say it's wonderful, but I, don't, I, don't, I think it's just fiction. Or you could say it's wonderful and it's changed my life, the way I live. And if you study this fact historically, no society went through a transformation based on a single text. The way in which the Muslims went through, with what? With the Qur'an. No society in human civilization, never. But do we believe that every ayah of the Qur'an is a miracle? Do we believe that? Is it a miracle from the very time it was revealed or later on? From then, from its inception, the very big first communication we had with the Qur'an, the first interaction human beings had with the Qur'an, every last ayah of the Qur'an is a miracle. This is what we believe. How many ayat of Qur'an are predictions? Very few. How many ayat of Qur'an are dedicated to scientific phenomena? Very few. How many of these things were even known to the Arabs of that time? Almost nothing. So what is it that mesmerized these people? What is it that every time the messenger opened his mouth, that they would be sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, they would be dumbfound. They didn't know what to say. Abu Jahl, Abu Sufyan, Akhnas ibn Shuraiq, these three people would hate on the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. They were the elders of the Quraysh. They were the seniors. They were the think tank. And they would sneak in the middle of the night and put their ears on the Prophet's apartment sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, they would listen to Qur'an being recited. And then they would sneak back before morning, and what happened the first night was they ran into each other. And they, the other didn't know the other was there. So the first guy is going, what are you doing here? He says, well, what are you doing here? So, <laughs> right? They, re they knew what they were doing there. So they swore they will never come back. They caught each other the next night. They swore they won't come back. They caught each other the third night. They catch each other the third night and they swear by their mothers, by their Lord, by their lives, they're never going to come back again. So they don't come back. But Akhnas, he's curious. He goes to Abu Sufyan and he says to him, we've been listening for three days. What do you think? Is this the truth? Abu Sufyan says to him, by the way, Abu Sufyan became Muslim much later. This is early seerah. Of course it's the truth. What else can it be? Okay, let's go talk to Abu Jahl. He's been listening too, right? So the two of them go and they talk to Abu Jahl. What do you think? Of course it's the truth. Abu Jahl says, of course it's the truth. But then he explained. You see, we're Banu Amir. And he's Banu Hashim. Right there, before I tell you any more of what he said, what did he take into consideration? The speech or the speaker? The rejection of the disbeliever came at the fact that these words, as powerful as they are, as true as they are, as flawless as the content is, as mesmerizing as the style is, we are not willing to accept this person. Because when we, when Banu Hashim gives charity, we match them. When they fight, we match them. When they show bravery, we match them. When one of theirs comes up with these words, we will never match them. So they have won forever, we can't let that happen. That was the reason. SubhanAllah, it's a different take on history. Even those who hated the Qur'an were mesmerized by the Qur'an. The Qur'an is remarkable, stunning, mesmerizing literature. You have never read anything in your life that will come close to having the impact, not just from the religious point of view, 
but even from the psychological point of view. You will not be affected by anything that you will ever listen to or read like you will be by the Qur'an. The tragedy of our times is that we have reduced the Qur'an to translation and reduced the Qur'an to certain isolated quotations by virtue of which we actually don't get to see the power in which it is communicating its message. And this is a big problem. By the way, the scholars of the Arabs don't have this problem. They see it. They see the beauty. This is a problem mostly for the majority of the people of this ummah who are suffering from iman deficit to begin with. And if they saw this miracle and they saw that mesmerizing power of the Qur'an, at least heard about it on a regular basis, we would necessarily see a change in attitudes. A change in the regard, the awe, the inspiration we take from this Qur'an. It would be a different relationship. The dynamics of that relationship would change.